definition of alone today means no pair, no human, just no, no pair, no team, just a human and their machine. And if we're using this definition, I'll stand firmly with my answer. How can we expect to create meaningful software with intuitive interfaces all by ourselves, with no input from others? Because none of us are perfect. Uh, it's the mere fact that we're creating software for others, designers, other programmers, end users. This really informs the fact that we can't work alone and expect to create something that makes sense to anyone but ourselves. Complete isolation is not a good idea, nor is it feasible. However, my hypothesis is that pair, pair programming may not be the best solution all the time either. Okay, now I'm gonna step into my confessional booth a la uh, MTV's The Real World. Creating this talk was really hard, and not just because it required a lot of research, but it also required a lot of soul searching and some deep reflection. I decided to give this talk, and to be honest, I almost backed out right away. A lot of what I was reflecting on from books and blog posts and things that I had been previously taught about pair programming were by people who really, really loved pair programming. And these are people I really respected, who are making some really good points. And this was diff difficult to reconcile with some of my personal beliefs and feelings, because I have to admit something to you all. Sometimes I really don't like pair programming. Uh, it was emotionally difficult to try to research the human elements of pair programming and to try to figure out why someone like me, who has been given some training in pair programming, who has practiced it for several years now, and really believes in a lot of its benefits, still dislikes it sometimes. While again, so many people are touting how it's the best way to create software, I was starting to wonder if maybe this pair programming world that I'd found myself in wasn't the right place for me. What was wrong with me and the way that I think and write code? What was I missing? This sort of thinking might be a little bit dramatic, but I'm in a confessional booth right now, so I think it's okay. Uh, also, my brain just works this way sometimes. Uh, there's a technique in pair programming called ping pong pro pair programming, uh, where one programmer writes the test and the other one makes the test pass. Uh, the intention of this technique is to create a robust test suite by driving out edge cases through test driven development. However, I also just heard of an anecdote about ping ponging where the developer writing the code intentionally punishes their pair for not writing the, t the, the test correctly. Uh, my initial frustration with this idea is that aren't we on the same team? Aren't we working together toward a common goal to produce the best software we know how to with the information we currently have? Why do we encourage this negative, competitive, and punishing attitude toward, to, towards our teammates? I said, why don't we just encourage our teammates? To be fair, I am a sensitive individual, uh, and this sort of atmosphere is not a productive one for me. I can imagine that giving the right pair uh, this sort of interaction could feel a little bit like a game and encourage a healthy sort of competition. But to be honest, I don't even like that kind of thing in board games. I like co cooperative board games instead of competing against my friends. So after hearing this anecdote, I was reminded again uh, my passion for my passion for the topic and why I wanted to talk about it in the first place. I worry that there are other programmers out there who haven't gotten the opportunity to work in a supportive, productive pair scenario. I worry that there are other programmers out there whose only pair experience has been with a teammate who's trying to punish them for writing a small incremental test that maybe they're just doing to get their brains warm up on the problem. I worry that other programmers think that something is wrong with them for struggling with pairing sometimes. And so though this talk was hard, uh, I believe there's an important message in here. Maybe pair, program pair programming isn't the answer all the time. And maybe there are certain things we need to keep in mind while we're pair programming to help us understand where our partner's coming from. So without further ado, I'm happy to introduce you to Gina and Louise Engel Pets, my cats. I bet you all thought I was gonna talk about pair programming now, huh? Uh, but they're so cute, I had to share. And not only are they cute, but they're smart too. Most mornings I start my day by waking up to cat whiskers on my face, tickling my face, and then a swift bite to the nose. This is Louise, she's the one in the back. Uh, this is her method for getting me up in the morning so I can feed her breakfast. I think she's like a physical learner and communicator. Gene, her brother, has a slightly different approach. He waits under the covers until he's really hungry and then jumps out of bed and starts screaming. Uh, he prefers the more like verbal manner of communication. Um, either one of these approaches, I think I could probably like ignore and fall asleep, back asleep when they team up, they always get the job done. 
I think that part of the reason they're such, a, a, such effective teammates is that they're working toward a clear, well-defined common goal, breakfast. <laughs> they're also really, really good friends. So cute. Uh, but every once in a while, Gene waits too long to get out of his bed, uh, get out of bed, and his hunger turns to hanger. Occasionally, when he gets his way, he takes his hanger out on, uh, on his sister by growling and hissing at her. Don't worry, they make up after breakfast. But my point in telling you the breakfast adventures of Gene and Louise is that even if you're working with your best friend and you have the same well-defined common goal, and normally you work really well together, teamwork is hard. And though most developers don't purr after they eat, and I'm definitely not condoning hissing at our teammates if we're hungry, but we do have some similar similarities to Gene and Louise. And just imagine the complexity and difficulty that's added if you and your teammates' work styles don't complement each other. Or if you're not best friends. Maybe you don't even know your pair that well. Or what if you don't have a very clear, well-defined common goal? No wonder this is a challenge. So today we're gonna to be discussing teamwork in general, and particularly pair programming. So what is pair programming? Though this isn't the official pair programming definition from extreme programming, it is from extreme programming. Um, and it, I'll, I'll read it out loud so that we have some, some different uh, learning styles can be engaged. But pair programming is a dialogue between two people, people trying to simultaneously program and understand together to program better. It's a conversation at many levels, assisted by and focused on a computer. So pair programming is when two developers work together on one task at one computer. Why does teamwork make the dream work? Why do we even care uh, sorry, yeah, before we get started about talking about the challenges involved in pair programming, why do we even care? And why does teamwork make the dream work? And more, more specifically, why do people want to pair? By teaming up with those who think differently and see the world differently than we do, we're exposed to new ideas and the group benefits from increased creativity. And since pair programming is in part about discussion with our pair, we have built-in brainstorming in every interaction we're able to more rapidly transfer knowledge to our teammates because they're able to see firsthand how our software works and ask questions in real time. This also gives us an opportunity to mentor new developers and point out design decisions and techniques that we're using. Having two developers look at every line of code we're creating allows for catching mistakes, which leads to less errors in our software. And this collaborative nature of producing code allows for a continuous review of our system. Also, by having two brains thinking through a problem, if we have a good partnership, we can allow our pair to take on some of the cognitive load so we don't have to keep the whole system in our brain at once. If collaboration, so if collaboration is so great and has so many clear advantages, why does it have to be so hard? And my, I posit that in part it's due to several mismatches in several areas amongst team members. And though these things can make teamwork difficult, it's also really why we need teamwork because there's so many ways that we can, as, indiv ind as individuals can differ, I believe that there's even more of a need to work together so we can create better software. I'd like to start the discussion of these mismatches by pointing out the fact that all of these ideas are based on putting people into categories or labeling them by type. And I'm sure those statically typed programming or language spans out there really like this idea. Um, but there's a little bit of controversy in, uh, in the fields of psychology and education over the human type system and whether the models that we currently have accurately sum up what it means to be human. I'll add that while I do personally uh, believe in personality types and learning styles, I also believe that perhaps humans are too complex and dynamic to pin down into types. However, I think that like most abstract concepts, this gives us a language to discuss and communicate with one another which is really important and helpful. So I see these types like software design patterns, a framework or common vocabulary uh, with which we to communicate to our team. First, let's take a look at personality types. There are a lot of tools out there to measure or determine our personalities. Uh, Carl Jung, uh, psychological types, the Myers-Briggs type indicator, the five-factor model, 16 personality theory, and in recent years, Bud, BuzzFeed has released a lot of really compelling tests. Uh, one of my favorites is which Hogwarts would you be, house would you be sorted into? Um, so today we're gonna look at a couple of models, but I wanna mention that most of these have similarities and are largely based on Carl Jung's theories. But first, 
I know you're all dying to know what Harry Potter house I'd be sorted into. Well, that's kind of personal, so I'm going to go back into the confessional booth for that one. First, I took the BuzzFeed quiz, which I have a link to. I'll have a link to in my references for anyone that wants to take it as well. And before I share my results, I want to point out that in this quiz, they ask you what house that you think you'll be put into, which I find interesting. So I'll, I picked Gryffindor because uh, I wanted to be from the same house that some of these like wizarding greats were from, Harry Potter, Hermione Granger, Albus Dumbledore. But it turns out I'm 40% Hufflepuff. I was unsatisfied with these results, so I took the Pottermore sorting hat test as well. Uh, Pottermore is the digital heart of the wizarding world. It's an online portal you can sign up for. You have to make an account to be able to actually be sorted into a house, which I happily did in the name of research. Hufflepuff again. <laughs> and I'm not upset about being a Hufflepuff. Hufflepuffs are, har Hufflepuffs are hardworking, patient, loyal, and fair. I guess I just always pictured myself as a courageous, brave, and determined Gryffindor. And before I get carried away, I'll return to the muggle world and to software craftsmanship. Though sometimes I wonder if software does belong in the wizarding world as well, because sometimes it's pure magic. Anyway, my point is that sometimes we don't or can't accurately figure out what our type is. Since our primary function is our, uh, in our personality or thinking style is the one we're using to reason about what our personality is, it's quite challenging to figure out. Oftentimes we're more aware of our secondary function, which I think explains why I was able to see, uh, where I wasn't able to see that I was a Hufflepuff, because I was using my Hufflepuffness to determine that. And my secondary Hogwarts house, the Gryffindor, is the one that I'm more associated with. Perhaps being aware that it's so difficult to figure out how we think ourselves will give us a little patience when we have to try to de decipher our teammates and how they're thinking. I also will mention that I took a what Game of Thrones group test as well, would you end up as well, and I was Targaryen, which I find kind of interesting that I am both a Targaryen, which whose animal is the dragon, and then a Hufflepuff whose animal is a badger. Very different, but anyway. Um, so besides looking at my sorting hat test results, we're going to look at some of the ways that thinking styles are modeled. The Myers-Briggs Type Indicator, or MBTI for short, determines one's personality based on how they answer a series of questions in a survey, and then those answers are mapped to four characteristic spectrums. These characteristics are likened to one's handedness. For example, I might be right-handed, and with time and effort, I could train myself to use my left hand. Um, this could be easier or harder for some people but it would probably be really uncomfortable. The first attribute that we're gonna consider is, that, is considered to be an, an attitude. Uh, so it measure, measures introversion and extroversion. At their core, introversion means inward facing, and extroversion means outward facing. Whatever our attitude is, is said to, uh, said to dictate how the rest of our characteristics behave. So the next two characteristics are cognitive functions. The sensing and intuition spectrum is focused on information gathering or perceiving our world. Or in other words, how we prefer to ingest and understand new information. Those that are further on the sensing side of the spectrum like to understand data information and like to understand information in tangible, concrete examples using their senses. They like facts and details. The meaning is in the data itself. People who are further on the intuition side like to understand information by under associating it with other information, either by things that they remembered or new things that they've discovered. They like to understand the big picture or the theory that the data represents. The thinking feeling spectrum is focused on decision making or judging functions. These functions are essentially how we use the information we've gathered to make decisions. Those that lean toward the thinking side like to use logic and reason to make our decisions. They like consistency and truth. Those that are further to the feeling side like to involve people in their decisions and like to create a balanced environment. I'm also realizing I just said we like to use logic and reason. Uh, maybe that was like a, a Freudian slip. I didn't realize I was a, a thinking side, but I might be. <laughs> so the last factor is the judgment perceptions uh, spectrum which basically identifies whether the individual prefers to use their information gathering function or their decision making function more when relating to the outside world. 
This is obviously a bit more complex than determining that I'm a Hufflepuff. A big important piece that I'd like to focus on is the in this spectrum is the spectrum of the introversion and extroversion, because this is a concept that is often misunderstood, including by myself. Rather than using these stereotypical ideas of extroverts always being outgoing, gregarious, and craving human interaction, while introverts, introverts are, being, are quiet, serious, and antisocial, let's instead consider what it may look like to view introversion and extroversion as merely influencing how our cogn cognitive functions manifest. In trying to understand how introversion and extroversion affect cognitive functions, I came across an article by writer and self-proclaimed MBTI nerd, Heidi Pribe, in which she can contrasts how our types could be affected by our level of introversion or extroversion. So let's unpack this a bit by looking specifically at the sensing side of the information gathering function. And just as a reminder, sensors like to understand information in tangible, concrete ways using their senses. To paraphrase one of Preeb's articles, if we're looking at the sensing side of information gathering, one who uses an extroverted sensing function takes in the world as it exists in the present moment. They're very attuned to sight, sound, smell, and touch. They're present oriented. One who uses an introverted sensing function is detail oriented. They take notes of facts, events, and occurrences as they happened and internalize them. They're usually more past oriented. Let's say that two programmers are working on a program that generates a report by maybe fetching some data, manipulating it, and then outputting it somewhere. And they already have one report, report A, built. Now they have a task to create a new report, aptly named report B. The introverted sensor may take a look at their report A generator code and then couple that with the details and facts they stored in their brain about the report A code. For example, in order to generate the report, they needed to fetch some data from another source. Or maybe they remembered that they tweaked some of the field names before they output them for clarity. The extroverted sensor may take a look at their, uh, their report A generator code and then look at several other related files, test out a bit of code in a, in a debugger, and then make us a decision how to implement report B. Neither of these processes are better or worse in my opinion, they're just different. And I could imagine how these two individuals would work really well together. This would be so great to have two different ways of approaching a problem, each thinking of things that the other one isn't. This could be so productive. But I can also imagine the scenario where it would not be so great. What if neither pair communicated their thought process and the extrovert just went off coding away while the introvert mentioned some really specific details that didn't seem to matter at the time? This would be really stressful and maybe pretty annoying. Now granted, this is a bit hyperbolic and this wouldn't be what we consider pairing or collaboration, but I've heard of pairing sessions that have gone kind of like this most likely because each party didn't understand how the other one was processing information. And now on to the next pair mismatch, learning styles. Suppose I was on a team with any of you and mentioned that I was a visual learner and then asked you to draw out an idea on the whiteboard. You would have a general idea of what I meant. And by explaining what I needed in terms of a, of a learning style, it might be a little bit more effective than saying, I don't understand you. It gives you a kinder way and more intuitive in a more in interesting way of knowing what I need. There are also a lot of models describing learning styles and like we focused on the Myers-Briggs indicator with personality types, we're gonna focus on a well-known uh, model called VARC for learning styles, which identifies visual, aural slash auditory, read, write, and kinesthetic perception modalities or ways that we perceive information. It also includes a mixed modality or those that identify with more than one of these modes. This model helps determine which of these modalities is the most effective for an individual. So let's dig into each of these. First, there's V for visual. Visual learners have a preference for learning and communication via maps, charts, graphs, diagrams, arrows, and perhaps that this learner might get a lot out of diagrams and might also produce readmes and documentation with a lot of diagrams. I'll draw, draw out sketches of their plans to understand information and point arrows to things to show how messages go from different components of our system. 
These programmers probably really care about the structure and the syntax of the code, the indentation, and the white space. They may find it helpful to draw on a whiteboard, and they may talk with their hands a lot to describe their software components, how their software components interact. The aural slash auditory learners prefer heard or spoken input and output. They get a lot out of listening and participating in discussions. They ask a lot of questions, and they may talk out loud while they're programming. Perhaps the noise level in the room, if, it's, if there's a lot of background or extraneous noise, this could be really distracting for this kind of learner. They also may repeat what's already been said or ask an obvious question, and this is because they need to say it themselves to learn it. They're not trying to annoy you. <laughs> uh, as an anecdote of why I believe that understanding our teammates' slash, uh, communication slash learning styles is important is due to an experience I had while pair programming that specifically involves someone who I believe uses the auditory learning style. Since we've established that my cat, Jean, is an auditory learner, let's just say it was Jean I was pairing with. It wasn't actually Jean because he's a cat and doesn't care about programming, but I'm using his name to protect the innocent. So Jean and I get along pretty well outside of pairing. I would say we're friends. Uh, we're of a similar level of expertise. And as we were pair, uh, while I was driving, he would seemingly tell me what to do sometimes. And not in a big picture sort of way, but in really detailed manner, like telling me how to print out some text in Ruby. And to be honest, this sort of bothered me. Didn't he think that I knew what the puts method in Ruby did? I'd been writing Ruby for about three years at this time, and printing a string using the puts method was something I felt very confident in. I realized that I was internalizing this angst and some frustration and anger with Gene telling myself things like, does he really have such little faith in my abilities? Does he not trust me? Or does he think I'm not good enough? I'll, after some complaining to my friends and family, some soul searching and some advice to look at the facts and not just internalize these feelings, it dawned on me, Gene is an auditory learner. When we're pairing and we get stuck on a hard problem, he stops and talks it through. He talks to himself while he's typing. This is how he processes information. He's not telling me how to print out a string in Ruby. He's just thinking out loud. He's being an active and supportive, engaged pair. And this was a game changer for me. Now, to be honest, Jean and I don't pair well together. I haven't been able to figure out specifically, uh, but it, it's just not smooth sailing with us. But after realizing the sort of learning and communication style he had, I was able to stop taking it so personally. Maybe it's OK that we're friends, that we can work on a team well together, but pairing for long periods of time isn't the best and most effective working style for us right now. And as my Aunt Jane used to say, and honey, that's fine. It's OK that we can't pair all the time. The point is we're able to understand each other a little better so we can work together on a team and still be productive. The next learning style is R for read slash write. These sorts of learners communicate uh, are focused on text space, input, and output. They like notes and lists, text in all formats. They take a lot of notes. They may even turn diagrams into words. Uh, I suppose these sort of programmers would be great at choosing well thought out method, method names and class names since words are so important to them. And not only do they probably write great comment documentation and commit messages, but they probably value great documentation and commit messages. So has anyone ever been working on some pair, on some code with a pair, and you run into something confusing, and so you go to the internet for help? I'm sure that's happened to a lot of people. Uh, I'm starting to believe that the, that the way one Googles for help, it may indicate how they learn and process information. Some people seem to type in the exact right words to get the answer they want. And then not only once they've searched for the thing, when they found the blog post or the Stack Overflow page that seems to be helpful, some people read every word of it, while others skim through and look for the code examples. I find this piece of pairing particularly challenging. Having to read something and process it and judge its helpfulness and then determine how to implement it in your code in the approximate same amount of time that your pair is doing, it's just so stressful to me, especially when we read and process and judge information differently than our pair. And to be fair, I'm not a read slash write sort of learner, so I think that's partially why this is so challenging. And the K in Bark is for kinesthetic learners. They prefer to use their senses and experience to learn, communicate, and process information. 
They benefit from real concrete examples, trial and error, using all of their senses and hands-on learning. I definitely identify with this style of learner. I like real-world examples. I want to be able to see the real output of code, even if a data even a simple data structure such as a hash. I know it's a hash, I understand what the attributes of a hash are. I would still prefer to look at the hash in my terminal, especially if there's a lot of complexity surrounding this hash. This is my default modality. And not being able to use it is really challenging, especially while pairing, because it may be hard to justify to a pair, let's print this thing out, this data structure out, because they'll be like, that's just a hash that we put the data in, we know what it looks like, but I like to see it nonetheless. There are also two types of multi-modality, uh, multi where there are people who are flexible in their preferences and kind of can adapt based on their context. The other type of modality are, are people who aren't satisfied until they've exercised all of their multi-modes. So um, if they have more than one mode, they need to learn in several different ways. They may be seen as procrastinators or slow deliverers, but they may just be gathering all of the information before acting and communicating on it. I also identify with this very strongly. I like to know all the things about a subject before I make a decision or communicate my thoughts. This is a challenge in a fast-paced environment. Going down all of the rabbit holes is not practical, and sometimes it's not helpful either. Story time again. Louise wanted in on the action. Uh, a couple of years ago, I started doing some research to write a blog post about the differences between blocks, procs, and lambdas in Ruby. For the story, it doesn't necessarily matter what the differences are. They're all pretty similar, uh, but have some like, different nuances. But as I began my research, I found myself in a rabbit hole and ultimately deciding that to truly answer this question, I had to first learn the lambda calculus. And for those of you who have written any Ruby, you know you don't really need to know all of the lambda calculus to use blocks, procs, and lambdas. And definitely part of the reason I found myself in this rabbit hole was out of curiosity. I was just plain interested in the lambda calculus, but I think there is more to it. There are blog posts out there that do a good job of explaining what each of these forms does, but for some reason I still didn't get it. I think that the blog posts that I were reading were missing the real world examples. They had code examples, but I had a hard time transferring that basic concept to the code base I was currently working in. And this, where, this is where, depending on the current context, a pair can be so helpful because they can help explain how to use a form in the code we're actually working on. The kinesthetic learner in me really appreciates this, but sometimes that's still not enough and I still don't understand the concept at hand. And then I feel behind as a pair, like I'm not contributing, which sucks. Perhaps this is happening because though my pair has helped my kinesthetic mode, there's still another mode that hasn't been satisfied yet. This is just a theory of mine that I'm working on, and I'm still trying to identify in those moments of confusion what I need to do for clarity. Actually, I was, as I was putting these slides together, I found myself in the rabbit hole of lambdas again. And I was in this rabbit hole knowing that I shouldn't be doing this, I should be working on this talk, but instead I found myself reading a, a blog post by Martin Fowler just titled Lambda. This was a blog post that I most certainly found the first time I tried to understand this, and I struggled with it the first time. But this time I just got it. I was able to read it faster. The fact there was C sharp in there didn't throw me off because I've never used C sharp. Uh, I also found myself not needing to open a console and create lambdas and procs and blocks in my interactive Ruby environment just to understand, which is interesting and really satisfying. In one of the original papers about VARC, the VARC model, there's a line that says, maturation and experience contribute to integration of the modalities and strategies are developed to transfer information from one perceptive channel to another, one perceptual channel to another. In other words, as we grow, mature, and learn, our ability to use modalities outside of our preference becomes easier. Which brings me to my next, the next mismatch, the experience mismatch. As you'd imagine, we, have all, we all have a different story of how we got into software, and each of these stories has implications on our knowledge and how we communicate about that knowledge. We could be self-taught, boot camp taught, apprenticeship taught, or university taught, or some combination thereof. We're Windows users and Mac users and Linux users. We have different programming language exposure, and so we all have different vocabulary to discuss technologies and ideas. We also have different amounts of experience in each of those areas, and here's where I'd like to start the discussion about experts and non-experts. 
There's a lot of discussion in pair programming that involves different members of different expertise level matching. And though understanding the dynamics of like an expert expert pairing and a novice novice pairing is really important, today I'd like to focus on the match, mismatched pairing, or the experts and the non-experts. An argument for pairing, or an argument for pairing is that it can be used for a tool, as a tool for mentoring, a chance for a non-expert to learn how an expert programmer works, to get familiar with a new language or a new system. And I definitely agree that this team dynamic can be really helpful but making sure that both programmers involved are prepared and com comfortable to play their role is incredibly difficult in practice. In pair programming illuminated by Lori Williams and Robert Kessler, they mentioned that expert programmer, that the expert programmer will need to be able to play the role of a teacher and that the characteristics of an effective teacher are patience, a willingness to explain patience, the ability to articulate clearly the work that's being done, compassion for the student, and most important, patience. I'm certain that many programmers have each of these abilities, but sometimes I wonder if, we're, if we underestimate the bravery that it takes for a non-expert to interrupt an expert and say, I have no idea what you're doing, help. One must have a significant amount of confidence to expose one's ignorance in public, at work especially, and maybe to someone who's their boss. Actually, I think that we maybe misunderestimate the bravery and confidence it takes for anyone to say, wait, I have no idea what we're doing. In my research, I came across work by Sally Ann Freudenberg, who is a psychology of software development researcher, which is a title that I grabbed from her Twitter account. She has a really interesting blog that I'll link to at the end as well. And on this blog, she posted her PhD thesis about pair programming, which is a super interesting read, which I highly suggest. Anyway, in her thesis, she points out several characteristics of experts that I think are important to consider. They have an, a distinct approach to their work, they recover more gracefully from mistakes. They have an underlying confidence in their ability, which she says maybe suggests that self-confidence plays a prominent role in expert behavior. So in a mentee-mentor style pairing, the one who has the underlying confidence is not necessarily the one who needs to throw up the white flag and ask, ask for help, which is interesting. Experts not only approach the problem differently through confidence and gracefully recovering from mistakes, they also think differently. They store and retrieve information from memories different from their memories differently and more efficiently than non-experts. They group units of information into larger groups of information in their long-term memory in a process called chunking. Whereas a novice may store the intricacies of a problem in small units of information that they have to think through procedurally in their short-term memory, which has a limited capacity. An expert has large chunks of this information that can be accessed. I've begun to read a book uh, at the recommendation of another eighth later called The ABCs of Learning, which I'd like to also recommend to anyone that learns, teaches, or mentors on a daily basis, which I bet is a lot of us. In this book, they mention that uh, people can consciously hold and manipulate approximately seven pieces of information at any given time. By chunking, the pieces, by chunking, the pieces of information can gradually become larger so that the expert can then engage in more information simultaneously than the non-expert. On the flip side, it's also been found that once a group of information has been chunked, it's really difficult to unchunk it. For example, if you ever had to ask, if someone ever asked you how to do a shortcut on your computer, one that you use 100 times a day, like switching tabs, I do command shift and the brackets, which I just had to do physically to, to be able to tell you what I did to do that. Um, Sorry, the phenomena that's happening because when I am not able to just tell you what I do is because I've become an expert in switching tabs. My brain chunks these micro steps of press command, press shift, press bracket, and then just becomes one message of switch tabs. And I'm not saying that the experience mismatch should be avoided, far from it actually, because I think getting to witness how an expert works is enlightening. And for an expert, having to explain their thought process could be beneficial in solidifying their understanding. But what I am suggesting is that this sort of mismatching could be exhausting for both parties involved, both mentally and also physically and emotionally. If a non-expert is having to continuously process and throw out pieces of information in their short-term memory that the expert just has there, the non-expert is expending more energy to get to the same outcome. 
So maybe we should just take breaks from these pairs and implement some cooperative work where the expert takes a subtask and gets it done quickly, feeling free to work at their high levels of, of abstraction and use their chunks for good. Also, this might be the kinesthetic learner in me, or maybe this is just an Elizabeth thing, but when I get the opportunity to work on my own for a bit after pairing with an expert, it's so motivating. I get to put all this cool stuff I learned into practice right away. Like I remember the first time I learned how to create a macro in Vim, I did everything in macros that afternoon. Things that an expert would think were, was absurd, but to me it was so exciting. And if we couple this difference, this, if we couple this thinking differently due to being an expert with thinking differently because we're a, of our learning styles and our personality types, then maybe we are thinking even differently than we previously thought. Humans and cats are complicated. And these three mismatches are only the tip of the iceberg. There are diversity and inclusion issues involved that I wish I had dug into more in my research and hope to do so in the future. There are power dynamics involved, physical comfort needs, including one's personal bubble, different vision needs, and seating and keyboard preferences, and anxiety and other mental health factors that not only are affected by all of these things, but also in, in themselves affect our cognition process. And we have to manage this all for ourselves and our interactions with our pairs while working on some pretty complex software problems. Pair programming is a conversation. And something that I'm working on and re realizing fairly recently is that this conversation not only can, but should include advocating for ourselves and asking for what we need. I mean this in very fundamental ways. Like asking people to go, asking our pair to go back to a piece of code that we looked at earlier, even if they don't necessarily want to. Needing more time to understand a problem. Looking up the documentation for something that is seemingly really simple. Opening up a debugger or a prize session and trying out a very small piece of code because we need to understand it. And sometimes asking for some time to ourselves for some unstructured play with the, unstructured play with the code. And all of this is challenging, but also I think it's what makes this industry so cool. We get to put on our psychologist hats, because software is about machines, but it's also about people. And you know what this is all boiling down to? Empathy and patience for our pairs and for ourselves is essential, which we could all use at some point or another because none of us are perfect, and honey, that's fine. I believe that investigating some of these differences about how we think and process information as introverts or extroverts by sensing or intuiting, visually or orally, or even in chunks, that we can become more aware of each other as humans and cultivate a supportive environment where we can create soft awesome software and feel really good about it. Thank you.